Welcome to Chapter 10 of the Washington State Beekeepers Association Beginning Beekeeping Certification Training. Well, we will look at pests and diseases. We will cover two sections in this chapter, pests and then diseases and conditions. In the first section, we will learn about the most common pests that we have in our areas and how they affect the bees, colonies, and hive equipment. We will also give the beekeepers some remedies and treatments to deal with them. First, we will take a look at the Varroa mite, also known as Varroa destructor, and its effect on the bees as well as how to check for and treat them. All the threats to the honeybees, there are none more destructive and dangerous than the Varroa mite. While the Varroa mite can be seen by the naked eye, they can be observed walking on frames, on bottom boards, on the thorax and abdomen of honeybees as seen in the pictures. Originally found on the eastern honeybee of Asia, the mites and the bees enjoyed a host parasite relationship. However, when the mites transferred to the western honeybee, they did not have a defense to the parasites resulting in the die-off of the majority of feral hives in the U.S. While feeding on the honeybees, the varroa mites infect their hosts transmitting viruses one of the most common viruses is a deformed wing virus as seen in these pictures. As beekeepers, one of the major tasks that we have is to monitor the mite count in the hive. If you observe mites by one of the means I explained earlier, you need to get a count of the mite in the hive. And you can do this by one of three methods. You can use the sticky board, a cooking oil method, as described on page 65. The second method is the sugar roll, which uses powdered sugar to cover the bees, forcing them to clean themselves this large in the mites. This is an effective way to get a mite count without killing the bees. The third and final way is someone like the sugar roll, except it uses ether or alcohol. The ether roll is highly effective, but the tested bees will die. You can read about both of these methods on page 66 in your manual. While well, August and September are critical time for the beekeepers to test and treat their hives if necessary, the question is what to treat with. There are two types of treatment to choose from. You can use hard chemicals or soft chemicals. Whatever you decide to use, it is important that every beekeeper understands what they are treating their bees with and the pros and cons of each. Hard chemical treatments and soft chemical treatments can be found on pages 66 and 67 of your manual. However, remember, hard treatments aren't as effective because the bees can develop resistance to these products and should not be used when the honey supers are on. While the soft chemicals leave little residue in either the wax or honey, if you follow the label, they have been used successfully either in rotation with each other or oscillic acid. Oscillic acid vaporization is the newest of the soft chemicals and can be used while honey supers are being used. Oscillic acid has been used with good success. Next, we'll look at the wax moth. While wax moth don't attack bees directly, their larva feeds on the comb and prefer the cells with the pollen used to feed the brood. 
healthy hives will take care of themselves. But hives that have been abandoned or improperly stored frames are the target of the wax moth. Depending on how messy the frames are, you can clean them off prior to placing them back into the hive or allow the bees to clean them out in the spring. Next, we'll look at the ant. While ants are small, a nest can overtake a weak hive. The best practice when placing a hive is to ensure that they are not located near an established ant nest. Natural methods including the use of petroleum jelly on the base of the legs, wood ashes, diametric earth, cinnamon, red pepper around the hive can be used to defend against ants. These can work if the ant nest is not already well established and hasn't already found the hive. It may be necessary to use an ant termite, termite bait such as flippinol buried inside the ant nest. The bottom right photo shows the use of wood ashes around an infected hive. While it is not always easy to tell the difference between a wasp, hornet, and yellow jacket, all three share a physical body makeup and behavior traits. For example, while the honeybee feeds on pollen and nectar, the wasp, hornet, and yellow jacket feeds on dead insects to include honeybees. One of the biggest differences between the honeybee and the wasp, hornet, and yellow jacket is their queens winter alone while the honeybee queens winter in a cluster. The honeybee is fuzzy while the wasp, hornet, and yellow jacket has a thin, shiny body. However, one noted benefit of the wasp, hornet, and yellow jacket is that they are native pollinators and prey on insects that damage agricultural crops. The paper wasp builds nests out of wood fibers. There are many kinds of paper wasps and they don't share the same level of aggression as the yellow jackets. Paper wasps have the umbrella shaped nests that are often found suspended under the eaves of buildings. These nests are usually relatively small and do not have more than 30 members at a time. These wasps are relatively non-aggressive good pollinators and beneficial to gardeners. One of the two main predators of the honeybee colony along with yellow jackets is not a hornet but a type of yellow jacket that is larger, not yellow, has a white face marking from which it draws its name. Yes, the bald face hornet. In the upper left photo, ball face hornets gather wood fiber and sap. In the upper right photo, a ball face hornet preying on the outside of a honeybee hive waits to grab a bee entering or leaving the hive. These predators may also invade a hive in mass in late summer, early fall, killing the entire hive. In the bottom right photo, we see the size difference of a worker and a queen ball face hornet. Yellow jackets may also make enclosed nets, but usually are found below ground. The ball face hornet's nests are shaped like large footballs made of paper from wood fiber. They are famous for their massive enclosed nests which can be seen hanging from tree branches or other sturdy perches. The inside of the nest has horizontal layers of paper cells for brood and can number in the thousands. Yellow jackets are wasp and are the other predators of the honeybee. They build paper nests in the ground that can be very large, defensive, and aggressive. The photo on the left shows a honeybee guarding the entrance, a dead yellow jacket at the hive entrance, with others waiting to go in. The photo at the bottom right shows dead bees on the ground in front of the hive with yellow jackets feeding. 
Yellow jackets can be a natural recycling agent for dead bees that are hauled out of the hive. And you will often see a few of them on the ground under the entrance of the hive. This relationship is beneficial. However, in the late summer, early fall, they are looking for much protein as they possibly can feed their brood and will take over even the strongest hive rel relatively quickly. The photo at the top right shows the entrance to a nest under a rock. The, the nest is much larger than what can be seen. It is well camouflaged and any disturbance near the nest will cause a massive attack. Next we'll look at prevention. If you set traps in early spring, the month of March, you can trap yellow jacket queens. You can use a 50-50 mixture of apple juice and water as bait in any kind of container that will allow the yellow jacket or bald faced hornet to enter but not exit. Since they are able to fly in cooler weather than bees, if you can trap an overwinter queen, you will destroy a potential nest. The yellow jackets in this container were caught in a 24 hour period in early September using apple juice and water as bait. The bottom section of the trap has canned cat food laced with flipanol. The entrance exit holes in the bottom of the are large enough that the wasp can enter and leave with the bait. In this case, you want them to take it back to their nest and feed it to their young in order to destroy the whole nest. Mice can damage a hive. Not only do they build nests and raise their young in an accessible hive, but they also eat the wax and stores. The best prevention for mice is to use an entrance restrictor in the fall. If you have skunks or raccoons in your area, you will need to raise your hive at least 12 inches off the ground to deter them from disturbing your hive. This will expose their underbelly to bee stings. However, when dealing with badgers, not only should you use a platform and raise your hive off the ground, but you should also secure your hive to the stand as the badger will knock it over. For bees, you can build a special platform as seen in the picture to the right, or you can use a 700 volt electrical fence to deter them. American Fowl Brood While American Fowl Brood does not affect adult bees, it affects the brood. American Fowl Brood is caused by spores producing bacteria. These spores can infect honey which is fed to larvae by the nurse bees. The spores can be dormant up to 70 years. American fowl brood is the most common and destructive of the brood diseases. To test for American fowl brood, use a toothpick, toy egg, or a pine needle. Stick it in the dead brood. When pulling it out, you will see a brownish ropey substance with a foul odor. There is no effective treatment for American fowl brood, and due to the extreme difficulty of killing the spores, it is recommended that you burn all woodenware and foundation. The Washington State Bee Association recommends treating hives in the infected area with teramycin, administered in sugar syrup, powdered sugar, dusting or patties with over 25 percent of american fowl brood resistant to teramycin you must stop treating two weeks prior to the honey harvest the best practice for preventing american fowl brood is to replace brood frames every three years next brood disease we'll look at is european fowl brood and it is caused by bacteria it has a strong sour odor with brown twisted dead larvae in the bottom of the cells. No ropey goo. As a prevention, you can treat with teramycin in the spring. 
However, some strains of European fowl brood are resistant to teramycin. The best practice for prevention is to maintain strong, healthy hives, keeping them in a sunny, dry location with good airflow. Italian bees seem to be more resistant to European fowl brood. The next brood disease we'll look at is chalk brood. It is caused by a fungus. The symptoms are dead lava that turns white at first and then black. You may also see them being cleaned out of the front of the hive. Chalk brood usually clears up by itself in the summer heat. The best practice for preventing chalk brood is to replace brood frames every three to five years. While lumped with brood diseases, chill brood is exactly what it's called. When opening the hives, when the outside temperature is in the low 50s or below, or when it's windy, raining, or snowing, the brood, if removed from the hive, could become chilled and die. The most common hive disease is Nitsema, which affects the gut of the honeybees. There are two types of Nitsema, Nitsema serrani, which can affect a hive at any time of the year, and Nitsema apis, which is the most problematic in the winter and spring, which you will be able to identify by the fecal droppings on the inside and outside of the box. However, there is a treatment for Narcema called Fumadil B, which replaced Fumagellin a few years ago, and it works very well as a treatment for Narcema apis, but not so well for Narcema serrani. In the photo, we see a pile of dead bees. This is a classic case of poisoning. To prevent this, Talk to your neighbors about where your bees are located and not to spray when your bees are flying or on days when the wind will carry the spray toward your hives. As beekeepers, we must educate those around us on how they may be affecting the bees without even knowing. It is a good practice to keep those around you informed.